All right. So we'll dive into it. Um, and I know that there's some newbies on the call, which welcome. We're so, so glad to have you. Um, and just to really quick introduce myself, I'm Teresa Casey. Um, I'm serving as EMA's uh, 2023 board chair. Um, and so again, I just appreciate all of you taking the time out of your day to join us and um, essentially stay motivated to uh, stay active in your prospecting efforts. I know that that's something that can be hard to do. Um, before I let Carrie go ahead and get started, um, briefly, I wanted to share a couple EMA updates with everybody. Um, first, if you are new to the Experience Marketing Association, or maybe you're just getting involved again, one, welcome. So glad to have you. Um, the Experience Marketing Association, we are a very sharing collaborative group of business owners and managers. Uh, we're all in the B2B sector and some B2C, but mostly B2B. Uh, and we are in a whole variety of areas of experience marketing, but we pride ourselves on that sharing and collaborative portion of who we are. Uh, and what is so unique about the Experience Marketing Association versus a lot of other associations is that we're able to connect with a sense of trust and transparency and we, you know, meant earlier, if you were on the call, I had mentioned that we really feel like there is enough business for us all um, so that when we share best practices, what works, what doesn't work, and what we've been going through in our business, uh, it's it's just going to benefit each of us. So um, per the majority of our membership, one of the most valuable parts of being an EMA member is attending our annual conference. So I just wanted to shout that out. Um, before we get going with prospecting. So if you aren't aware yet, our uh, conference is going to be September 17th through 20th, uh, and that's going to be in Annapolis, Maryland. Um, we are going to primarily focus on growth in our business um, when it comes to the general sessions at that conference. Uh, however, one of the really beautiful parts that everybody loves about that conference is the time that we get to spend talking with people who do what we do. So we're gonna have breakout sessions for each different service area and um, give you the opportunity to connect with business owners and talk about a whole lot of hot topics, one of which is AI. Um, everybody's talking about that. How is it gonna impact my business? What do I do with it? Um, and we want to have a chance to give business owners the opportunity to talk to each other, uh, talk about what you have been able to do with AI, how it may have benefited your business. And, um, you know, we, we don't necessarily want to put any fear in you. I, I am personally one who is always, um, excited to jump on to change. Yes, it can be scary, but I think that we can find ways that it will benefit our business too. So, uh, there is going to be, um, registration open. I We're hoping um, in the next month. So if it's in, of interest to you, please save the date and uh, you will get some notifications via email. So now back to prospecting, now to Carrie, just really quick to introduce her. Um, I had the chance to be introduced to Richardson and Richardson earlier this year. And uh, I did hear their sales prospecting 101 um, presentation. Some of you may know I've been doing cold calling for many years now, and I always appreciate the chance to just refresh the fundamentals of prospecting, get some affirmation that I am indeed going by industry practices, what are the best practices, and um, after getting to listen to their expertise, I felt that this was something that could be really beneficial and a big value add to our EMA um, community. So um, a brief intro on who Richardson and Richardson is. Uh, Ian and Carrie ask the right questions to the right people to create plans that are grounded in perspective and tied to your company's vision. They know all too well the daunting and frustrating challenges that we as business owners face daily in the fight to grow and sustain our business. They have shared those same struggles and they seek to be partners who understand your challenges and have the experience and tools to help you gain control of your business and lead it to what your definition of success is. So with that, Carrie, I will hand it over to you. Thanks very much. Can everyone hear me all right? Okay. Well, thank you for inviting me to present today. Uh, it's always fun to share my uh, joy of prospecting with other people. And I know people uh, usually are not, it's polarizing. Cold calling is polarizing. People either love it and they believe in it and they do it all the time, or you just couldn't pay them enough to go anywhere near it. So when I think about sales prospecting now, I think we would be remiss to just think about it as telemarketing. There are lots of different ways to engage with your market. 
one to one, one to many. And we like to think about those for all industries. And I could spend all day trying to think of ways to get people to engage with other people, um, either on the phone or through email or through events or through marketing. And I feel like everybody on this call has an equal amount of experience in getting people to engage here. You belong to a marketing association. Your whole role is experiential marketing. So I have to assume that there is a big part of your brain that is consumed with how do we get people to experience this in a way that's going to be positive for our businesses. So I like to think about that first and foremost, how is prospecting presenting you to the world? So if you're outsourcing to third parties, do they understand your mission and your vision? Do they understand the things that you're doing and selling and the things that you want? Are they able to clearly convey that messaging? Right? Or if you're engaged with somebody or you're gonna hire somebody, are they going to provide that initial experience? So when I think about prospecting, I think that's the first time that anybody is going to interact with my business. What does it sound like? What does it feel like? You know, you guys more than anybody else should understand the importance of that first interaction. So when I think about prospecting, it's not just a, you know, a phone call. It's like, how is this person on the other end of the phone experiencing this conversation? And I'm using my husband's setup here. So pardon me while I figure out how to move the slides. So. I'm Carrie Richardson. I'm one half of Richardson and Richardson. And my husband and I usually joint present this, but it's really hard to do that on a webinar without talking over each other or making the webinar go long. So we decided I would just present today. Uh, our background is this. Um, I have owned and sold two outbound telemarketing agencies. One company specialized in a very specific niche. We worked with managed IT services providers and the vendors that sold to and through them. And the other company was more of a generic, we'll call for anybody who will pay us type of company. I sold the first one in 2020 during the pandemic when staffing became impossible. And I sold the second one in 2021 to a vendor that I was outsourcing to when I was unable to staff. So they weren't ideal exits. It's not like I'm sitting back and not working any longer. Uh, but it was a really interesting experience. And I have built sales campaigns for over 1,500 companies. Uh, Ian owned an IT company called Doberman Technologies here in Lansing, Michigan, and he sold that in 2021. Uh, he really wanted to be consulting. He wanted he used a methodology in his business called Stratop, uh, which is strategic operations. It was founded by a gentleman named Tom Patterson, and Ian used that in his business to double in size over the course of two years. And he's such a big believer in it that he went to get certified in that methodology. And that's really where his heart and talent lied. And he wanted to be doing something uh, you know, for his final rodeo, as he describes it, that would impact the world. So our vision is to change the world through entrepreneurs. And we believe that if we help enough people get to their vision, of, uh, their version of success and achieve their visions, that the world is going to be a fundamentally better place. So prospecting for new clients is something that's just like for me, it's I could pick up the phone right now. You could just tell me like, hey, these are the kinds of clients that I want. And I just pick up the phone and I'd start calling them. I wouldn't do much planning. I wouldn't prepare. But I, I've been doing this for a really long time and I'm really comfortable talking to strangers. I'm happy to be like, hang up on me. That's fine. Tell me I don't know what I'm talking about. That's fine. As I know that 40 minutes from now, you've moved on to the next part of your day and you don't even remember interacting with me. If I called you again in 90 days with my pitch more prepared, you won't remember that one crappy phone call that we had 90 days ago where I didn't understand your business or what you needed or what you wanted. So I'm like a scientist when I go on and when I start prospecting. If I've engaged with a client, I want to get my hands in there. I want to find out what are people asking? What are, they, what are they interested in? It's really hard to do that without getting on the phone and actually talking to people, whether it's your current clients or your prospective clients. Why are people working with you? Why are people even buying the things that you're selling? I really want to understand that before I build any kind of prospecting campaign for a company. So these are the major things that I would focus on when I was getting ready to build a sales prospecting campaign. The who, the what, the when, the where, the why, and the how. So the target, super important. The activities that we're gonna do to reach that target. How often are we gonna do those activities? Where are we gonna track what we're doing and how are we gonna track what we're doing? Why are we doing this ultimately? Like what's our goal? So before I wanna start doing something, I wanna know how many of that something I'm gonna to have to do to get the results that I want. So for us, for example, I always want to have $2 million in the top of my funnel and I want $700,000 to come out the bottom of the funnel every year. 
So in between that 2 million and that 700,000, there's a big gap, right? So I have to stuff the funnel with $2 million worth of business all the time in order to get the return that I want at the end of the year. And for me, I know exactly what that breaks down into. I have to make 40 outbound calls every day. And as long as I'm making my 40 outbound calls every day, I'm going to be on target because I've done the math backwards and I know exactly how many activities I need to do to get to my goal. So I wouldn't want to engage a team of five people, for example, to market for my business because I only need nine clients a year. Throwing four people on the phone to find nine pieces of business every year would be overkill. So first understanding how much business you need and then how much of each activity you need to do to get to that end goal is pretty important. If you have questions throughout the presentation, go ahead and ask them or save them till the end. It's the, as long as we are on time, I'm, I'm fine either way. So when I'm, I mean, I'm presenting to a group of marketers. Does everyone here understand TCP or UCP or do you use a different term for it, like target client profile? Nobody, I can't, no, I can't hear anybody, but. The first thing that I want to look at is what is your unique TCP? And do you have more than one of them? Because a lot of people will have more than one type of business or business owner that they're targeting. So if I have more than one TCP, I'm always going to start prospecting for a client at the place where I can point the cannon and shoot something fastest, right? Where is my lowest hanging fruit for this client? So I stole this right off your guys' website. Uh, if you have more than one target client profile, you want to pick the one where you can get engaged the fastest. So when I look at this website, right, we've got on-hold messaging, digital signage, sent, and we were talking a little bit, Teresa, at the beginning about whether the companies on the call today did a lot of all of these things or if they were just specific one company did this, one company did this, one company did this. I'm gonna assume for this presentation that everybody's doing more than one thing. So if you are a niche focused, you know, we only sell this one thing, then your TCP is probably gonna be simple to define, right? You sell one thing to one, you're selling scent to hotels. That's easy. We know who your target is, right? But if you're selling scent to hotels and seven other kinds of venues, odds are they want something different out of the experience. And same with sound, if you're selling to businesses that are putting people on hold, that's gonna be one experience. And if you're selling to somebody that's more consumer focused, like if I have to wait on hold for an hour and a half to get a Ticketmaster ticket, for example, I might want a different experience than just sitting on the phone waiting to talk to the guy in the office. So I see a lot of different opportunities here and I want to figure out the strategy to reach each of those individuals. And I'm likely going to create multiple campaigns prioritized by low hanging fruit. So for me, low hanging fruit, I always think about what's the lowest cost thing that I sell? What's the easiest thing for me to sell where somebody doesn't have to go get budget sign off from someone above them, for example. So what's the amount of something that I can sell into a prospect? where they're not going to have to go get their boss to sign off on it. That's the easiest way to get into a business, something simple and inexpensive where nobody needs to be displaced. So I don't have to get their, I don't have to displace their current provider. So first thing you want to think about is, are they already buying this from someone else? Because the sales strategy will be different if they're already buying it versus if it's a, a blue ocean opportunity and nobody's buying it yet. I want there to be low to no barrier to entry. So if I have to wait three years for them to end a contract with another provider, that's a huge barrier to entry. What can I sell to someone right now, simply and easily, without it causing a lot of impact in their business that could be negative, right? Change is challenging. It's hard to convince someone to change when things are working. I don't know that that's even good stewardship when you're trying to convince people to change something that's actually working for them. Most of the time, what I want to do is identify what's not working for them. Then I want to find something that I can introduce to them that's going to be simple for them to kind of try before you buy. So for Richardson and Richardson, for example, we do a business health assessment for $2,500. Before you sign a check to us to do your strategic planning for a full year, maybe you want to see what the experience will be like a little bit. And we make it easy. We credit them back half of the value of that business assessment if they decide to do anything else with us in the future. So they've got a year to decide if they'd like to work with us after. It's a lot easier to sell $2,500 worth of something than it is to sell $120,000 worth of something. 
So I want to get in there. I want to land. I want to expand. I want to think about things that have shorter sales cycles. Right? So again, if there are competitors already engaged with the prospect that you want, and they've got long-term contracts that are difficult to get out of, you know, I want to think about, is that really what I want to be targeting to this particular client? I want to find things that I can sell to them that they're probably not buying yet so that I don't have to compete with an embedded provider. I want to think about the clients I have that aren't buying everything from me. That's also prospecting. Right? If everybody isn't buying everything that you sell, you've got lots of opportunity in your pipeline before you even pick up the phone to prospect into a random unknown person. And then I want to go back and revisit people that I used to do business with, and I want to revisit bids that I didn't win. And I want to understand why I didn't win them so that I can better sell to that prospect moving forward. So here again, I'm looking at if you if you offered all of these things for your business, and I, I'm sure that not everyone is selling everything. I'm looking at what are the things that people could purchase without displacing an entire relationship with a third party provider. And I don't, I mean, I've never bought scent marketing, so I have no idea how much it costs. I don't know what the buying process looks like, but I mean, most of the time people buy things because it's going to make the money or save the money. So help explain how it does that. And you're halfway through to making the sale. They have to like you, that helps a lot. So which actions are going to engage with which segment? So if I look up here, if I'm selling scent marketing, it looks like there's a bunch of different ways that that could impact an organization. I could use it in stores. I might be selling it to hotels. Um, trying to understand the places. Like I lived in Las Vegas. Everything has everything smells like something in Las Vegas. Every casino has its own unique scent. Every hotel has its own unique scent. They're even spraying scent into the nightclubs. And I assume that's to cover the smell of the carpet, but maybe it's to make it into a better experience. I don't know. Um, but I, how am I going to get into those segments using prospecting, right? So when I'm reaching out to a hotel, hotel the first thing I'd want to think about is like, are they making those decisions at the hotel level or at the franchise level? Is there, what is my point of entry for that? And until I know what that point of entry is, calling is kind of a, a blind exercise, right? So you should understand who's making the buying decisions and where they are in the organization. And sometimes that requires some mapping. You're gonna go through, have conversations and just find out who does this, who makes this choice, how often do they make it? And this one's important. Is this a long play or a short play? Are you one and done? Or are you going to spend more acquiring the client than they're gonna spend with you in say the first year that they do business with you? There's lots of like, um, when I own my telemarketing agency, it cost me about $6,000 to secure a new piece of business all in. And that's how much um, they paid for a month of telemarketing. So I really wasn't getting any margin on telemarketing unless they stayed for four months. So you wanna think about how do you balance the cost of prospecting with the value of the things that you're selling? It doesn't make sense to call people one at a time for a lot of different things, especially now when people might not answer the phone all the time. So think about how, what's the total lifetime value of the sale and how much are you willing to spend to secure that piece of business in hopes that you can land and expand it? Or are you just focused on the long haul? Are you looking three years down the road? Are you prospecting now to engage, build relationships and secure opportunities that aren't going to come until substantially later? Is a one-to-one -one prospecting methodology the thing that you want to choose for your business? One-to-many, do you wanna combine it? I personally love the one-two punch of a phone call to invite someone to a group webinar. So instead of having to explain to people one at a time the value of X, I want to sell the idea of talking to me for an hour or listening to me for an hour, just like you guys are right now. I wanna sell them on that. And then when I get everybody into the room, ideally I've got a couple of my current clients already in that room and they're gonna ask intelligent questions and they're gonna interact with the, the, the peers in the room and hopefully you know, big me up a little bit throughout the event. But I wanna sell the idea of getting them into something. Instead of trying to sell them something on the phone, I'm selling them on the idea of coming to this education session where we're gonna talk about the things that are important to them. So instead of trying to spend an hour on the phone with every person I wanna do business with, maybe I can spend 10 minutes on the phone with them, get them all into a room together and secure more opportunity at one time. 
stuff like associations is fantastic for us. If I can identify the leader of an association and they're a group that is interested in sales and marketing, that to me, that one to many opportunity, that's a win, right? I don't have to call each of you individually and ask if you're interested in sales coaching. I can just ask you all right now. Pray and pray is what uh, we call telemarketing. I, uh, I'm still old school that way. I love it. I will do it all the time, uh, 40 times a day, as a matter of fact, if you remember my earlier comment. And it's still working. It's still working for us. So I'm going to keep doing it until nobody answers their phone anymore. Because the fewer people that believe that it works, the less cluttered that route into a business is. So if you don't think cold calling works, that's okay. I'm fine. I will call for one of your competitors just happily. So one day we're going to wake up and nobody will have a phone anymore. And I got to say, we probably have about 10 years until that time. And I doubt very much that my children are going to be conducting business on a desk telephone. And maybe they'll be texting each other. I'm not sure. A named account strategy is identifying your biggest and best opportunities and devising a strategy uniquely for them. So when you're prospecting, you really are one to one talking to one person about one thing that has to be such a high value account that if you win it, it will fundamentally change the course of your business. So don't spend a lot of time on $10,000 deals. You know, if you've got a $600,000 deal in your pipeline, that's the person that you want to create a named account strategy for. You're not going to telemarket into your best opportunities. You want to figure out how are you going to one-on-one -on -one connect with that individual. One of the questions we get asked most often is like, how often can I follow up with someone before I get a restraining order? <laughs> and my answer to that is as often as you want until you get a restraining order. Right? So it's going to be very different depending on where they are in their buying cycle. So if you talk to someone and you identify that they just signed a contract with one of your competitors, you've got two opportunities. You can either dig in a little deeper and find out if they're still in, you know, like a remedy beginning of a contract area, or you can nurture this opportunity, identify how they chose the person that they did business with last. So, oh, that's great. Looks like we missed the boat. Oh, sorry to hear that. Um, how did you choose XYZ Co? Like, what were you looking for? What problem are they solving for you? All right, well, how do you evaluate new vendors? If we'd like to be considered three years from now when it's time for you to decide who's gonna provide the service to you again, what would we need to do in order to be considered as a potential vendor? So really just asking them, how do I win your business? And if they're not being really forthcoming about who they're working with, why they chose them, it's probably not a great way to invest your time, but you can put them on the back burner and reach back out again a year from now. You know when their contract's ending, they've told you, so you know that there's business three years from now, but it wouldn't make sense for you to call them every week. Hey, how's it going? Hey, how's it going? Hey, how's it? Like, you're not going to do that. You might call them every six months, you might invite them to an event that you're hosting, that you have some clients at that are buying the same thing that you were trying to sell them. So think about ways that you can interact with those prospects on a regular cadence based on when they're going to be ready to buy. And we know when they're gonna be ready to buy because we're gonna ask them straight up in the first conversation we have with them. How do they make that buying decision? What's their budget for it? You wanna qualify as soon as possible in the prospecting process. If you don't qualify on the first call, you might find that you spend another 20 calls trying to get the CEO of a company that was never going to buy from you on the phone. So whoever answers the phone on your first interaction, most of the time you can qualify by company size, for example, with anyone who picks up the phone. You don't need to go right to the C-suite to find out how big their business is or how they choose vendors. And the person that's answering the phone is often more in tune with what's going on in the business than many of the other senior level employees that aren't interacting with everybody every day. So this person, this kind of key individual is interacting with anybody that's trying to sell them something and probably interacting with everyone that they're buying something from as well. So they're going to have information that you're going to find valuable. And data is the key to prospecting success. So once you get that person on the phone, think about the things that you need to know in order to consider a company a qualified prospect for you. Is it a, a revenue qualifier? Is it a size of company qualifier? Is it a territory qualifier, right? There could be lots of different ways that you qualify or disqualify leads. The sooner you can qualify or disqualify an opportunity, 
the less time you have to invest in trying to pursue that. So if you think about how many calls you can make in an hour, for example, for me, that number, if I'm not using any sort of technologically assisted dialing platform, uh, is about 11. I can call 11 people an hour. Can you still hear me? My earbud just did a weird thing. Okay. So if I can call 20 people in an hour and there's eight hours in a day, right? Like you need to consider Sorry, I'm... if you could call, if you called somebody 20 times and you could have disqualified them on the first call, that is a full hour of marketing time that you're never getting back. And as leaders of our businesses, we have finite time for sales and marketing as it is. We've got eight other hats on. So I want to make sure that every call that I make is meaningful. So I want to eliminate any extraneous outbound activity immediately. And I want to get those people off my mailing list. I want to get them off my marketing list. I want a nice clean list with up-to-date information of people that might actually buy from me one day. I don't ever want to pull anything out of my CRM. I just mark it as dead. And that way I don't re-import garbage every time I go to a trade show. So if you're exhibiting at an event, for example, and you get a list of 100 attendees, that's going to go up into your CRM. If they're dead, if 80% of those weren't good leads for you, you mark them as such so that you don't go to the next trade show in a quarter, interact with the same people, pull them back into your database, and then waste that time prospecting into the exact same leads that you've already disqualified. So you can mark things as dead of the water and keep them there for as long as you need to. I have leads that I haven't talked to since 2014 in my database. I just don't want to have to re-engage with them in a way that wastes my time or their time. Like we're, we're both business leaders and we both have things to do. And they've already told me quite plainly that they have zero interest in telemarketing and they're never going to do it. So I'm not going to keep hounding them. Yeah. Just, just a quick How many question. You Can I ask a quick question? Yeah, or, of course. Or just um, at any, any point in, in, in the hour here, are we going to talk about kind of the, the levels, uh, organizational level that we're calling and you know, because because oftentimes I think about, well, geez, I got to make X number of calls. Well, I know I, I'm less likely to get a senior, senior level person, but I might get a lower level person who would at least give me the information to know whether this this particular place is qualified or not. So, mm -hmm. so I mean, the downside is, is if you get the, the director level person and then you realize that you have to get to the VP person, right? How do you you know, it's, it's just all the issues around leveling and where to call and, and when to call. Is that going to be covered at all in this? Yeah, I think like I can answer that now. When I'm talking to anybody, the first thing I'm going to ask them is for help, right? This is what I do. Who should I talk to about that? Hmm. And so for me, it would be like, who should I speak? Like, who who's the person that decides whether or not you're going to use telemarketing as a strategy this year? And like that might be the question that I ask the first person I talk to and they're either going to say, oh, that would be me or, oh, no, that would be Jim. Great. What's Jim's title, please? Oh, Jim's the director of marketing. Great. Is Jim in right now? Oh, before I waste Jim's time, companies that work with us see the most return on their investment when they X, right? So for me, it would be we work with companies that have more than $2 million in annual revenue because that's the place where we find most entrepreneurs have not yet invested in growing their businesses strategically. So somewhere in between two and five, if they've already hit five, they're probably doing something already and we're going to have to bump out that incumbent. So I don't want that business. I don't want under two because they really can't afford us no matter what they think. And it's going to be a large investment for them. And it, unless they've hit that 2 million mark, the odds of them, like two things are going to happen when they decide to invest in their business at the $2 million mark, they're going to grow to five or they're going to go back to one. All right. So that's kind of like a magic place in our industry. So understanding your industry and where those, like we call it the badlands, where the badlands are. So qualifying on price, for example, that's like, that's what we do. Um, you may want to think about the things that you absolutely have to know and who can answer those questions for you. Personally, I think that anybody that answers the phone is the person that you're gonna ask those qualifying questions to. Because if I get the CEO of a $5 million business on the phone, I don't wanna waste his time asking him how many computers he has. And like, I wanna understand those things before I have that conversation with him, if at all possible. And if that's my first, like if 
by some miracle, the CEO of the company has answered the phone when I've called, I better be ready to pitch them. So it's good to be prepared to have that conversation. But normally what I want is to fact find or I call it uh, mapping. I want to map the company before I get the audience with the person that I'm seeking. I mean, I mean, that, the, the, the common the common thing you run across, I, I think a lot of this run across is you tell somebody who's a certain level um, and then you ask the question, which I think is the right question, which is who, who should I be talking to? But oftentimes the response is, well, send me some information. I understand what you do now. Send me the information. And I'll, I'll, I'll find out who the person should be. Right. Great. Uh, what information can I send to you? We have a lot of different pieces of collateral. I want to make sure that I'm going to speak to your specific pain points. What are you trying to do with X, Y, Z right now? Right. Like now I'm going to bring the conversation back to what problems are you trying to solve so that I can send you the right information? And I'm just gonna keep doing that. I'm gonna keep redirecting every time they try it. Like every time they say, hey, send me something. Yeah, no problem. What should I send you? Explain to me what you're trying to do. Mm -hmm. And then I'll just sit and I'll wait. And mm -hmm. then they'll think about it for a little bit. And then they'll either answer the question or they'll come up with you know, excuse two why they don't wanna transfer me to that person. And I think that you don't have to do it all in one fell swoop, right? You can get to that person gradually in baby steps. If you can get them to answer a couple of questions, great. Now you can start mapping the organization to figure out when I have the conversation with Jim, I understand now that here's here are the problems that they're experiencing. Somebody's validated those for me so I can have an intelligent conversation with him. I can mention that I spoke to Jim and Jim said he was trying to do this. Here's the way that we solve that problem. And then I'll ask open-ended questions about what they're actually trying to achieve. And, and I wanna get that budget question in there early, early on. There's no point in having a conversation with someone who wants to spend $10 on something that costs a thousand dollars, right? Like that's a really important question to get into prospecting early on. And I don't know what the, you know, your total addressable market is. If you've got hundreds of thousands of prospects for your total addressable market, you can afford to make lots of mistakes. If there are 500 companies in North America that you can do business with, you need to knock it out of the park on all 500. And you really want to prepare differently for those conversations than you would for what I would call a spray and pray campaign. Did that answer your question, Jim? So I feel like based on that conversation, I want to scooch down to less strategic and more like just tactical ways to get somebody on the phone. Does that work for everybody? Okay. So what you're talking about, Jim, is what we would refer to as a gatekeeper block. And a gatekeeper is any person that won't let you talk to the person that you need to talk to. Now, one thing I like to remind people about when they're having that initial gatekeeper conversation is you don't know who this person is, right? Yes, they answered the phone at the business, but it could be the owner of the company. Like our phone, um, when we had a, an office, it would like jump around until somebody picked up the phone. So it could be anybody. It could have been the president of the company and it could be the, the most junior person at the company, but you never know who's gonna answer the phone. So always treat the person that you're speaking to as if they had the ultimate authority to buy what you're selling. That whether that's true or not, they could be married to the CEO of the business. So they could be related. So if you get kind of like, you try and be vague or you're being dishonest, like, oh yeah, no, I met Jim at a trade show last week and he asked me to follow up. Like, well, no, I, he didn't and you didn't. And I know that because I was also at that trade show or whatever, right? There's lots of ways where that can go sideways. So I just want to be as as upfront about what I'm like, if, it, if they ask me if it's a sales call, yep, it's a sales call, right? Like I want to be 100% transparent with why I'm calling. I'm calling from this company. This is the problem we solve. Who should I speak to about it? And that's the only thing I really want to say to a gatekeeper. I want to ask an open-ended question that isn't may I, I don't wanna, I'm not asking them for permission, I'm asking them for help. So I'm not saying, can you please transfer me to Jim? Even if I know that Jim is the decision maker, I'm never gonna ask for him by name. I'm always gonna ask the person that picks up the phone to tell me who I should talk to to help me. And that way they're less on guard and like, who is this? And like the minute you have to start justifying why you're calling that person, the conversation gets challenging. 
So if you say, hey, can I talk to Jim? Who is this? Oh, it's Carrie calling from Richardson and Richardson. Why are you calling? Oh, I'm right. Like I could have avoided all of that by just saying, it's Carrie calling from Richardson and Richardson. I'm trying to figure out who I would speak to for strategic planning. And then I would just wait. So if that doesn't work, there's lots of like little tips and tricks for getting through or around gatekeepers, right? Call early in the morning before they're at their desk. Call at lunch hour when someone else is staffing the phone. Call after 5 p.m. when the IVR is gonna go looking for other people to answer the phone. So there's also wait and get the voice by uh, dial by name directory. If you already have the names, that's super helpful. And if you don't, I just kind of look for common, like if I luck into an IVR, like Simpson, it's a pretty common last name, Smith. And then when somebody picks up the phone, I'm like, oh, I'm sorry. I was trying to reach the HR department. Can you transfer me back there, please? And then they'll transfer you to the department that you want to get into. So the prospecting is really less about trying to sell something to someone than it is about trying to connect the dots. Like, what does this company look like? What do they need? What do they do? How do they do it? Who does it? How much are they spending on it, right? So when I'm calling into a company, I want to find out, first of all, like who is the decision maker, but more importantly, like what are they trying to achieve there? So for us, when we're cold calling on behalf of an IT company, for example, I won't know anything about the company that I'm calling into. All I know is I bought the list on Dun & Bradstreet. They have more than 20 employees and they have fewer than 100 employees and they don't have government, they're not a government contractor. The only thing I know going in. So I'm going to sound really dumb trying to prescribe anything at the beginning of a call because I really do have no idea what that business does. So I want to find out what do they do? How do they do it? You know, where are they located? Are they multinational or is there one location? Think about the things that you absolutely need to know before you can sell something to someone. And those are the things that I want the gatekeeper telling me. I don't want to waste that conversation on the CEO. I want to have it with anybody, anybody who'll answer the phone. So this is what we do for objection handling, and it's a nice little mnemonic, ask, acknowledge the objection, state a fact about your business, and keep the conversation going. I just want people to keep talking. The longer they talk to me, the more likely it is that I'll be able to secure an appointment for my client. If they're going to get off the phone super fast, I know that there's no chance that I'm going to engage with this person. So I'm going to continue to ask them thoughtful questions that require answers and try really hard to never ask any question that starts with a can, may, right? will. So the biggest objection is usually we already have that. What are your, like, instead of me going through all of these, maybe somebody could throw out the objection that they experience the most often when they're trying to get through to someone. We don't put people on hold. We don't put people on hold? Do they have? Yeah, we don't need on hold service. We don't put people on hold here. I mean, I don't even have a phone, so <laughs> I guess I I fall into that bucket pretty aggressively. Um, were you put on hold while you were waiting to talk to that person? Because that'd be a pretty good indication <laughs> that they weren't interested. But is that an actual qualified prospect for you? It could be. If they don't put people, so what other, like, what else can you sell to them if they don't buy that? Well, so what we've done, not that we are by any means the model or nor have the experience that you have, but we, when we exhibit at a trade show, people will walk by, oh, well, we don't put people on hold. We, my reception, I'm a dentist, right? my receptionists always pick up the phone. They never put people on hold. Oh, we actually lot. go to the trade show. Yeah, right. I say that you're, you're in on hold denial and you can go to on hold therapy or take an on hold pill. That's your choice. But here's a piece of tape. We've actually had printed duct tape and we say, take this tape with our telephone number and put it over your hold button and let us know when you actually use the hold button and you'll give us a call next week. I like that as a trade show giveaway. They're also, uh, but we often a lot of people hear that. I'm sure like some, I'm sure there are other people on the line that, that also hear that as well, right? So they're using it as an objection, but they're not, you're not on the phone with them at the time. Well, it's, I mean, we, we have been on the phone with people who say that. All right. So your biggest objection is we don't put people on hold, which is just we're not interested. 
really, right? Like at the, the base underneath everything, that's just a version of no thank you or not right now. So determining whether it's not right now or never is kind of an important piece in there. So I kind of like to like travel with them into fantasy land at that point. Like, all right, well, imagine that your business grew overnight. You hired a new dentist. Now you've got a waiting list a mile long and you have to solve this problem because you still only have one receptionist. You haven't found a second one. People are going to get put on hold. What would you do then? You know, like take them on like a, the, I learned this from a parenting book of all places, like giving your children things and wishes like, oh, I wish we could do that today. I wish we could go to the zoo every day. Wouldn't that be wonderful? Let's talk about that. What would the zoo look like? What would we go see first? Right. Like, and you kind of take them on this little journey with you. So I would try that first and foremost, when somebody's throwing out an objection that it's just truly ridiculous, that either they a hundred percent have no interest in buying from you or they just at that moment are busy and they want to go see their friend who's at booth number four and they have beer, right? Like trade shows are kind of a hard thing to navigate simply because you've got people vying for your time everywhere and you probably want to be gambling. You don't want to be on the exhibit floor. You're, you have to go gather up a handful of stuff so that your boss knows that you went and then you go off to do your Vegas thing. So we do a lot of trade show exhibitions as well. And we're never going to use telemarketing as a huge, um, a huge objection for us. I was like, yeah, never is a long time. We'll talk to you in a couple of years. <laughs> so what other objections, like what's a, like, I don't want to call it a real objection or a not real objection, but let's get to things like budget. How much does it cost to do something like this? So what types of businesses are interested in it? Are you selling to everybody or do you only sell to a unique subset? Justin, I was asking you, but. Hear me. Oh, sleep there for a moment. Sorry. Um, the, <laughs> <Thanks>. um, <laughs> no, I'm joking. <laughs> I was on mute. Um, we, um, uh, what, what do we often hear? Um, uh, so, uh, with our service, um, you may or may not know voice over IP often comes preloaded with stock music. So we don't, we hear it every day. We don't need your service anymore. For example, a cancellation or an objection to why they wouldn't buy initially because we have the music for free. We've got music for free. So why would I uh, part ways with some of my hard earned dollars and pay you for something that we they equate to free, you know, equivalent to something that they are receiving presently for free. Um, so the first thing I think about there is differentiation, right? So mm -hmm. everybody in our space uses 3CX or some version of 3CX, and they all have that same dun, 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 dun. Dun, 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 dun. I can sing, like I know it by heart. I've heard it so many times. Every IT company in North America, like 80% of them are using whatever service that is because that's the whole music for all of them. And if I'm experiencing it like that, so are their customers, so are their prospects. So if I have to wait on hold, and let, let's assume that for an IT company, for example, their customers are never calling them to say, thank you for doing a great job. Right? Like that is not the calls that they're getting. They're getting angry calls from angry people who can't use their stuff. And you promised them that you'd be able, they'd be able to use it and they can't. And so every call they're taking is angry. And now they're sitting on the phone, listening to this canned bullshit music, right? Like I'm just sitting there getting angrier and angrier. My server's down. I can't work these guys, you know, had they done something differently, maybe my experience would be different with them. So when I think about an angry customer calling in and getting listening to the same crap that they've listened to forever, is there an opportunity to diffuse somebody by what you're playing on the phone? Right? Like I try to think of use cases where, how would this experience change if the thing that you were doing changed? Like almost giving, like spoon feeding them, like, well, here are six ways that this might've made a difference in your world today and kind of painting them a picture of like, all right, let me tell you about an experience I had once, right? You have to make sure, first of all, like that they're not trying to rush you off the phone. So if you haven't made a lot of phone calls and you haven't, like I can tell when somebody's like, okay to chat and when somebody's just like, yeah, 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 trying to leave the office. 
So you want to make sure they have enough time so you can ask permission to continue at that point and then tell them some stories. Like, do you have some interesting stories that you can feed to people when they say something like that? Like, oh, we don't need that. We don't, we don't X, Y, Z. Okay, well, what don't you do? Do you not provide customer support? Oh, no, you do. Okay. What would you do in this situation? How might this have changed that situation? So I want them to think about real things that have happened to them over the course of their business and how one different choice might have earned them something different. Can you like make a list almost of the, of the ways in which that particular thing would have impacted their business differently? Right? So instead of using that canned hold music, what could they have done and how how did it save the day, right? Like, how are they the hero now? Yeah, I, I'm not sure if you're speaking directly to me. Um, but, no, I'm just but talking I'm in general. Chat, but, yeah, <laughs> this is great. <laughs> um, we, um, I think it varies by, by industry, of course, right? I mean, so we try to have the ammunition of like, hey, do, but, you know, do all of your patients, doctor, know? all of the different ways they could spend money with you. Even, even your longtime patients, the ones that started with you when you first opened your practice. And, oh my God. And you, you know, we, right. we, ask question, we ask questions like that we know the answer to, right? Of course they don't. You have no idea half the things your dentist can do for you. And um, they know that, we know that. Okay, well, let's, let's circle back to what is it that you wanna be doing more of, you know? or selling more of at the pizzeria. That's so we, my we med kind of, spa right obviously. there. Like Botox and what else can you do to me? That sounds expensive. Let's do that twice. Right. So do you have specific verticals and you target with specific messaging? So what I hear there is the conversation that you're gonna have with a dentist office is probably going to be different than the conversation that you have with a construction office. And like whether it's a business to consumer thing where I can be put on, like, I'm being put on hold because I'm trying to book an aesthetic appointment versus I'm being put on hold and my shit is on fire. And it's very, those are two very different experiences. So how do you craft a message that's appealing to both? You probably can't. So I almost want to look back, like going back to TCP, when you're building a outbound prospecting script to appeal to everybody, you're probably going to appeal to nobody. You most want to take buckets. So you've got your your health in your health users, for example, or you know, like think of the three biggest um, adopters of your service, and then create your prospecting script to speak to that unique subset versus trying to be everything to everyone on every call. And I like to segment my calls into those buckets so that I'm not making calls to different industries constantly. Like I'm not talking to a law firm and then a this and then a that and then an IT firm. And then if I'm going to talk to dentists today, I'm going to call every dentist on my list because I've got the same, I'm going to have the same conversation over and over and over again. And I, want, I don't want to flip back and forth. So it's a whole lot easier to have a conversation like that when you're having the same conversation a bunch of times and you'll get better at it every time you have it versus switching and flip-flopping where you never have a chance to perfect that conversation and the flow of the conversation and the just a little like things that you learned on the last 10 calls that you made. So I'll usually try and roll in what I've heard from people. So by the end of the day, when I'm on call number 100 to dentist number 100, I probably have that conversation nailed. I can probably name the three things that they're struggling with the most just because so many other people talked about it that day. So I want to get really, really good at being as niche focused as possible. Do you organize your days by segment? Do you organize them by priority? Like how do you set up when you're gonna prospect? When I think about prospecting, what I wanna do is be as efficient as possible. So I wanna get, I got my 40 calls to make. I've already got them prioritized by what I wanna work on that day. And I'm just gonna like start hammering them down, right? But I'm gonna try as hard as possible to get now, all the IT calls that I, all the, all, all the IT companies, I want to call them all on the same day. Right? If there's dentists, all right, call them all on the same day and start thinking really specifically about stories that are relevant to that particular segment. 
so that when they say something like that, you have two or three stories that you can tell them right off the top of your head. Most of these objections are all the same objection, right? They're just a version of, I'm not interested. Right? Sometimes people are super polite about being not interested and sometimes they're not. This is a particular favorite of mine. We don't take sales calls. Okay, how do you evaluate new vendors? What do you mean? Well, let's say you're not happy with your IT services provider. How do you find a new one? Oh, well, we would go to people in our network. We would just, oh, great. Okay, how do I become that person in your network? How do I earn the right to ask for your business? And that's ultimately what I want to know from them. Tell me what I need to do differently than the company that you're working with now. Tell me what would have to be different for you to consider making a change. Right? Like I want to keep them on the phone and just keep asking them. I don't even have to explain to them what I do if they're at like, oh no, we don't, we don't do that, right? Either real or perceived, they believe they don't need it. So how do I just get them talking? How do I get their guard down a little bit? Because that's normally what I've found is that people that don't like to take sales calls are really easy to sell to. And that's why they're so guarded because they've been screwed around a couple of times, right? They got, they got bait and switched or like something has happened to this person and they know that they're an easy mark and they're gonna be as protective as they can be. They're gonna try and keep a mile away from sales reps because they know that they aren't an easy mark. So most of the time when you're getting those aggressive right out the gate, we're not interested. It's because they bought something recently and it didn't go the way that it planned, right? Like they, they didn't like it, they weren't happy, it didn't, they didn't do what the sales rep said it would do. Like me, I will buy anything and I hate every vendor I've ever had. Right? So I wanna make careful decisions I love getting cold calls because I like to put them through their paces. But I mean, we're a two person consulting business. What do you, what, like, what are people gonna sell to us? And then I, most of the time I like to say that right up front, there's two of us. We have both retired from our previous businesses. We're not looking to add employees. We're not looking to do anything, but spend the next five years working with companies that want our advice. We don't wanna get any bigger. It's just gonna be the two of us. Right, so we're not really in the market for anything new, but I still want to talk to them. So if you don't take sales calls, I would say now is a really good time to start because you can kind of evaluate what worked on you. Like, what was the point in the conversation where you went from, I don't want to talk to this person to like, ha ha, you laughed at their joke and now you're theirs, right? Like, so whatever it is, there's like a point where the conversation switches from them feeling attacked to them feeling invited. How do you create that experience for them? You want that moment where you're just like, come on, come on. Okay, there you are, right? Like they know when they have you and you know when they have you too. May, may I share similarly, or uh, I've always gone to on vacation, we've always gone to timeshare presentations, but just a, a true love of the art of sales how they are I don't think I could go to that discussion uh, we don't anymore um but but uh, along the lines of just you know kind of learning um I I don't think I've ever admitted this and certainly in front of this group of long friends here but um I have probably watched more get ready to smile Mike Edwards hours of QVC than anybody you will ever meet. Thousands That's the shopping of hours channel, right? Of QVC. That's right. And because it's it's on all the time and it's selling you something right now that your life doesn't need. And I don't know why I felt like I needed to share that just in that moment. What have you purchased that you didn't need, though? Never purchased. I've never purchased one thing on QVC. I just love the art of the sale. And similarly to taking the sales calls and kind of understanding where in that moment do you did, did it click? I like thinking like, where are they going to make this spatula in eight colors interesting to me that I need to buy it in plum purple you know or whatever so i just i you know along the lines of you take the sales calls because you learn from what you're you know 
Yeah, you know, I like to ask people where they are. So for technology anyway, which is what I've sold mostly for the last 10 years, I always want to ask them a question to find out like, are you, would you consider yourself an innovator or a laggard, right? Like, where are you on the innovation scale? Are you the first person to try a new technology or are you like the last person in your group that gets a new phone? Are you the last person to be on Facebook? Are you the last person to, or are you the first person to? Like, if you can figure out what their risk is, for example, like for, for me, I want to know if they're the first company to always buy a new technology solution, I can kind of hone in on that, like, competitive advantage of being first, right, of being different, of being unique. And if they're not that person, the safety that comes with sitting back and watching to see what the market is doing, but that time is over now. Like it's now you're going to get left behind. We're going to have to move you up a few bumps. I don't know what the the similarity between experiential marketing and technology sales would be, right? But most of the time, it's just the right message to the right person at the right time. How do we know when it's the right time? We ask them. How do we know if it's the right person? We ask them. Right? Like, are you the person that makes the decision? And when are you going to make the decision again? And those pieces of data are the most important things to get into your CRM because once you've got when they might buy and what they might buy, you can now figure out how to work backwards and create your marketing funnels to speak specifically to those people. So if, you're, if you've got dentists and construction companies, for example, are they on the same mailing list? Are they on the same email marketing list? Are you segmenting data out to speak specifically to the things that are important to that particular vertical. A lot of companies, especially smaller companies, will just kind of put everybody into the same marketing bucket versus divining it out where you're sending 100 emails to this specific group, whether that's by territory, by size of company, by pain point that's been identified, or by service that they're considering buying. You can segment really well in most common CRM systems these days. We're at time and I wanna respect everybody's time since you all agreed to spend an hour with me today. Uh, I'm happy to stick around and answer some questions if you have them. When you're doing your own webinars, always make sure you have like four or five fake questions that somebody in the audience can ask you. So when you're presenting that information, when you pushed everybody, every dentist is coming to your webinar now to talk about why they need on hold. What did you call it? On hold. Messaging. On hold messaging. So we're going to talk about on hold messaging today. At the end of it, what you don't want is that silence where nobody asks you a question. So always have two or three in your back pocket and have somebody like, at the beginning of the webinar, maybe like just text them and say, hey, do you mind asking me these questions at the end? If you don't have a, a second person on the webinar with you who's feeding them to you. And that way you never have to have that like, either I did a really good job or a really bad job. I'm not sure which yet. Well, I, I have a question here. Um, you've basically been talking about reaching out on the phone. Are there any other avenues you utilize, emails? Anything else? I use need? all kinds of, I mean, I use lots of different methodologies, but I am an outbound telemarketing expert. That's where most of my experience lies. So I don't like to guide people too much to other types of marketing. If it's not using the phone specifically, there are other people that understand it better than I do. And if you'd like to meet some of them, I will tee them up for you for years. There's lots of experts in email marketing. I'm not one of them. You know, I can kind of guide you to like, here's what I do after I talk to someone. Here's what I do before I talk to someone. But ultimately, my engagement point is the telephone. And for our industry, it's a, it's a, it's a way of qualifying as well, right? So we know when we call, we get put on hold. If we hear a message point, we know they already have a supplier. If we hear that wonderful music that you described earlier, we know that they're a prospect at that point. So I think, you know, I think most everybody here will agree that the best way is to get on the phone and talk to people. I would almost take that, um, if since you can evaluate that by a phone call, you almost could have like somebody on Fiverr that you paid nothing to 
go through a list and just kind of like, okay, well, that's 3CX, that's this, that's that. Like there are a couple of like very well-known on hold standard music. Is that a way to describe that? Like, and they can identify that for you. And then you don't have to do that part of it, right? You could pay somebody like $3 an hour to just call 500 people and then identify, okay, like teach them which music is what, and then have them like, fill in that blank for you. And then you can create your buckets of how do I market against 3CX? How do I market against this particular company? How do I market against this particular company? And then you create your battle cards. So you could say, here's you know, like, I know that you use this and I know that because I, I heard it when I called you, right? Here's why we're better. May I ask, or go ahead, is that Joe? No, no, go ahead. I was just agreeing. I was just gonna ask that, you know, how do you avoid burnout, you know, I mean, with with yourself or your employees or colleagues or team members who are, you know, it's so easy not to pick up the phone and call, right? I mean, it's like so easy for anyone who has, it's it's like so easy to stop and get off that that horse, right? And how do you avoid the burnout? Because it's, it's really a, a grind, right? That's two different questions. Like, how do we how do we enforce productivity, and then how do we make people not hate themselves at the end of the day? <laughs> the uh, so at our uh, telemarketing company, we hired um, out of workforce readiness programming. So people that came to work for us had normally done a little time, perhaps, or just gotten out of rehab. Maybe they were living in a homeless shelter. They have been gainfully unemployed for a significant period of time. And they have been in environments that required an incredible amount of structure. So if you are in rehab, for example, you get up at a certain time, you make your bed, you do these three things, you do this, this, and this, it's very structured. Jail is also very structured. So we had to create an environment that was also very structured. It's one of the reasons that our business would, didn't survive the pandemic. It's hard to create structure for an individual living in a halfway house with 12 other men, right? Like we, we just couldn't pivot to that. But we, like one, we threw money at the problem, right? If you make, so our minimum qualifier, like just to keep your job, we call it permission to play. A permission to play value would have been 100 calls a day. If you make more than 100 calls a day, your income goes up accordingly. So once you hit your base qualifier, you're good, you're, you're employable. But if you want to make more than your $12 an hour, here are the metrics that we're measuring you by. And we're never measuring people by the number of sales appointments they can get in a given day because we can't control how many people answer the phone. So when I incentivize somebody on a metric, I want it to be a metric that they control. So you can't control who answers the phone, but you can control how quickly you get back on it. Right? That is a metric that my employees can control 100%. So that's what I'm going to bonus out on because I can see whether or not you're just lollygagging and taking... You know, if you've got 90 seconds in between dials to finish up your after call work and go on to the next one, if you can get that number down lower, your money goes up. Because I know it's just a numbers game at that point. When you're spraying, pay dialing, if you make those 120 calls a day, you're going to be successful. You can't not be successful. The law of numbers declares it so, right? This many people are going to answer. This many people are going to take meetings. And as long as you're consistent and you're doing the process the way it's outlined, you're going to be successful. And we have the numbers to back that up. So I never felt uncomfortable telling people you're going to make $60,000 a year if you can hit these four variables. And one of those variables isn't how many people agreed to meet with me today. Because we can't really bully anyone into a meeting. And I don't ever want a badly qualified meeting going onto a client's calendar. So we can't really push them to get the outcome of good sales meeting because they don't control what good is. And they can't control who actually shows up to that meeting either. So one of our core values was find the joy. And we just encouraged everybody to like, find that one thing that you love about doing this job. Is it the person that's sitting next to you? Great. You know, like find a way to interact with them more often. But for me, it's, I'm a business owner and I'm calling other business owners and those people have the same problems that I have. And I'm going to try and sneak in a couple of questions <laughs> that will benefit me in some way during that cold call. And so if I'm a business owner calling another business owner, I want to learn how they're handling a problem that I'm experiencing. And so I have the opportunity not just to try and sell my own stuff, but I have the opportunity to learn how other people 
running bigger and better businesses than mine are solving those problems. So I'm not just going to talk about what I do. I'm going to ask them questions. And then sometimes we'd be like, okay, let's, um, everybody that says the word whatever on call today, you get a point every time you can say the word whatever, right? Or today we're going to ask everybody what high school they went to. And like there's lots of ways to engage your floor. But personally, to stay motivated, you have to find something that you don't hate about calling because you're right, you'll find a hundred reasons not to do it. So I have a question. So I, I know we have some members in the past that asked me about, uh, you know, sharing a telemarketer. We, we've had one like most of our existence in this business and we don't at the moment. So I'm hiring another company right now. So are there things that you would look for or think we should look for in evaluating a company to make outbound calls for us? Yeah. Uh, so the first thing I want to know is how many human calling hours are being committed to my campaign. I don't want to talk about outcomes. I want to talk about actions. And like, I want to understand exactly how many times you have to dial the phone to get the results that I need because results without data don't help me get better at it. And so I want to know what went into getting this meeting. I wanna know whether it came from an email. I wanna know if you sent like a, a sequence of things, right? Like, did you send 15 emails and then make one phone call to win this meeting? Or did you make 15 phone calls and send one email? Right? Without that information, I'll never be able to build my own sales team the way that I want it to perform. So I wanna know, what are they doing? Like, what are the actions that they're doing? Where are my callers located? I wanna know not where is the business located, but where are the callers located? There are lots of markets in the US where a caller with an accent isn't a problem. And there's a couple of markets where it's never going to do uh, any good for you, right? So there's large cities, you can get away with pretty much anything because everyone's used to hearing different voices on the phone. But in smaller Midwestern towns, for example, the odds on a telemarketer with a heavy accent being successful, very slim, right? So you wanna figure out like, what do the callers sound like? Do you get to interact with them? Are they gonna send recordings to you? And if so, is there any legal liability involved in that? Like, are they in a one party state or a two party state? So figure out if they're gonna send you call recordings but they weren't allowed to record them to begin with, who's gonna own that at the end? What are their data privacy policies? I wanna know that now, right? Like that's a big challenge. Who holds the bag if somebody complains? Is it gonna be you or is it gonna be the third party that you're working with? And are they representing you on the call? So data privacy, actions. So depending on price point, like for, for us, a, a full-time agent was $12,000 a month. That was a North American agent. English is a first language only worked in that specific vertical and that's all we did so the more specific the company the more they can charge so the lower their rates the less likely it is that they're a niche specific provider or that they're um, using north american talent if that's something that's important to you you said twelve thousand dollars a month that was for a full-time agent but it's a very very specific industry if so, I, uh, the person I sold my call center to charges half of that. So for a full-time agent, they're closer to six or $7,000. And they are a more generic company, right? They will support any company that will work with them. Whereas I will only work with a company that looks like that. So, so you're saying your agents that you pay, that's the going rate that you pay their salary? Or is that what someone that's what people who is pay hiring me. you? Oh, I so see. Nobody, so, so, there's, there's, so they're not me, receiving. Yeah. The, okay, I see. I see. I understand. So your your that individual is obviously making less than that because you are a business, right? So obviously, correct. So I mean, is our there, margins were about 40 percent. Okay, so we'll do that math. It's still it's but still a solid salary for that to, individual. Um, yeah. No, they're. I mean, there's other, I mean, marketing goes in there as well. So our agents base salary wise made about 12 to $15 an hour, depending on their experience. And then they could make up to $65,000 a year if they were on target with all four of their variables.
but nobody's paying you like nobody paid me because my telemarketers were amazing or highly qualified. I have to hire four telemarketers for every one that lasts longer than 90 days. My churn rate is 70% a year. So every, I have to hire every week. I have to train every week. I have to maintain a I have to pipeline of prospects to come in and work for me every week. Half the time we hire them and they don't show up for day one or they show up for day one and they don't show up on day three. Right? There's a million reasons that telemarketing is challenging to bring into a business that isn't doing it. And most of the time it's just like a, it's a revolving door role. Nobody dreams of being a telemarketer when they grow up. Right? It's a job that people take because they need a job, not a job that people take because they really want to get better at this job. So we're going to have them for less than two years, guaranteed, and probably we're going to have them for less than one year. The really good ones are either going to move up or move on. So you're constantly working with a revolving door of agents. So your agent on your account when you hire a third party agency is going to change constantly. Just expect that and don't don't be weirded out by the fact that it happens. Well, that was to my point of the burnout, that it, it is real. I mean, it's truly. I don't know. I have people that have been doing it for six years. And then I have people that can't stand it for a day. Right? Like you have to have the temperament. What you're looking for if you're doing it yourself. Again, we're, we're really over now, but I have nowhere else to be. Um, you're looking for somebody that has customer service orientation, first and foremost, like they, you want somebody that's going to dot the I's, cross the T's and do everything within their power to make sure that everything is right. You're not looking for somebody who's great at sales. You're looking for somebody who's very detail oriented, not somebody who's going to try and bowl someone over to get to the close. You want them to gather data. So Michael, if your outsourced agency won't provide you with information on what they're doing, that's not a good relationship because you'll have nothing to measure, analyze, or improve on afterwards. And that's the most important thing is how do they get better? Like once they take on your account and they learn all about you, how do they improve? Okay, thanks. Thanks for the info. Would you mind putting your contact information up on the screen once more? I appreciate you guys. Thank you for uh, sticking around for a few extra minutes. It's been really fun. Yeah, thanks, Carrie, for presenting to us. Um, before we officially wrap up, does anybody have any last lingering questions that you want to ask now versus, you know, obviously you can always reach out to Carrie and Ian um, via the contact info? I just want to say thank you. Yeah, thank you. It was a pleasure. A wealth of knowledge. Yeah, yeah, thank you very much. And they are wonderful. Um, Eddie and I got a chance to um, chat with them. And and yeah, there's a lot of knowledge that they have and um, that they're willing to share. So they're great. Um, I will go ahead and wrap things up for us then. Again, I appreciate everybody attending. Um, and look forward to seeing everyone soon. We have, uh, I think our next like general session webinar is coming up um, later this month. And it's with um, none other than my own um, spouse. So he's gonna be talking about employee retention and um, how to compensate st uh, sales staff. So hope to see you all there if I don't encounter you before, but thanks again, everyone and enjoy the rest of the afternoon. Great, thanks, thanks everyone. Bye. Thank you. Thanks, Carrie.